spoken to by Rob Prophet White. He is the director of mathematics and numeracy at the Learner First. His session today is titled Open the Question, Open the Possibilities, and he'll be speaking to us about how we can change our way of questioning as Kaioko to open more opportunities for learning. Now, without any further ado, I'll pass it on to you, Rob. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be able to share my screen as well. So I'll just come on to here. Okay, so um, kia ora koutou and no ingarangi okru tipuna and no ingarangi aho. Ki oto tahi toko kainga inayane and ko ro profit white aho. It's wonderful this Saturday morning to be with you. And the idea today after speaking to Robin was just to go through some of the work we've done over the last number of years with the refreshes that we were doing in Australia and also now here. And just looking at ways around opening the task up because we know open tasks are something that should be part of um, everyone's in everyone's kit. Eh? And there's plenty of things out there. So we're just going through some of the techniques and insights from teachers who've been doing them for a number of years and how they're using them as a bit of a bridge from moving from that explicit application type task as we move into the more unfamiliar type tasks that are mentioned in the common practice model. Now, obviously, to make this a bit more interactive, we'll go through a few things. So the idea is, you know, open-ended tasks are designed to open up the thinking because it says a certain type of question leads to a certain type of thinking. And recently in Peter Lillijar's book, Thinking Classrooms, you know, he does go into the open task as a major focus there. So as we look at this one here, I always, always start that when I'm working with teachers, whether they're in new entrant or whether they're in year 13, we have some work around that given and stipler area that talks about if you take the numbers out of the question initially, you will get Tamariki actually focusing on the situation model and the words. So it's a useful tip here. And after a while, they get used to this. So the hands of the clock were making, and then in pairs, can they come up with five different um, times it could have been? So one example might be the hands of the clock were making an acute angle. And in pairs, could they now come up with five different times it may be? So just for the moment, just for like 30 seconds now, if you want to just put a few things into the chat room, I'm pretty sure somehow we'll be able to keep an eye on the chat rooms going in as they go through those things. Rob, we can't actually see your screen. Okay, that's nice of you to tell me, actually. So thank you for actually doing that. Um, let me just try that again, because I've got sharing rights. But um, let me just check that again. We can see it now. Thank you, Rob. Oh, you can. Yeah, just, just chuck it into slideshow mode, Rob. It is in slideshow mode. No, no, you're in um, <laughs> present mode, should I say. Yeah. It, but beautiful. Okay, so... Um, yes, I can. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So we've got the acute angle here. So thank you again for saying that. Um, so the idea in the chat room is going through some of those answers about the acute angle. And then with any open task, we want to make sure as well that we add what's called restrictions because we don't want them to be too open too open might lead children to be going off on tangents looking at patterns but not actually having any mathematical rigor to these so what we'll do is we'll go into looking at how we can add a restriction so this could be a restriction here so if you have a look at those now does that add any changes to your solutions? I can see a couple of things in the chat room there. So that's an idea to get us started. Now, just a few slides here of overviews. What we're looking for, we know from a lot of research, whether it's um, Anthony Walshaw's best evidence synthesis, and there's a you no know, 
a lot of empirical evidence around this, around the power of the tasks. We want to make sure that to enact any curriculum around the world, we know good teaching is good teaching. Countries will naturally badge their own curriculum, but end of the day, good practices practices and good tasks are good tasks. So we need to make sure that we cover a range of different task types and open is one such task type. We also know from Anthony and Walshaw that you know teach knowledge is fundamental to effective teaching practice and therefore some teachers are able to incorporate open-ended tasks very readily and some teachers might need some initial support so they get initial success in doing this. We owe it to all our teachers in our schools to help them feel confident and supported if they're going to try something new. And they do need plenty of time to do that. Just a quick one then. So the basic exercise application tasks, we know that we've got, they make up a good part of it. And we're not saying not do these and they're essential, but we don't spend too much time on those. So the idea is these are good, but the surface nature of these might not allow kids. And when you start doing open, Based on teacher evidence, they say some students initially are a little bit hesitant, especially kids who may appear to be usually the highest performing kids, because it just destabilizes their thinking and their certainty. But we want them to realize that open tasks are an essential part of mathematical experiences. So be aware of that. Another thing is the actual open and familiar thought. This is heavily you know, shown in the common practice model of the current draft around meaningful situations they don't know. So the open task is a really good way we're finding of moving from the blue into the darker green. So jumping straight to dark green can cause issues initially, but the open tasks and in the icons here, you see Peter Sullivan over 20 odd years ago started releasing open tasks and this book now is in its multiple editions as teachers use it and most schools we go to they've got at least one or two copies i would heartily recommend that this book is a really powerful part of a good balanced diet of mathematics it gives teachers instant activities that are open open and naturally, it then inspires teachers to write more tasks as well. So that's a really powerful book, that one there. Also, if we're going to activate the do's of any curriculum, every curriculum has do's, but they're called different things. And the wording can change in different countries, but they all come from the original research around Swafford and Kilpatrick. The idea is if you want these do's to be activated, which is essential, we need the common practices. And we also need to make sure that the tasks are correct. One draft we're just making with, with a number of schools at the moment is where they all fit in. And this is not meant to be an exemplar, it's meant to be a discussion point. So a lot of the schools we're working with are looking at this. Top right-hand corner, we're looking at the open exploration because this is where some teachers have said to me, Rob, these are like play-based learning. Absolutely, play-based and discovery does have its place if the teachers are able to maintain the mathematical rigor. And now we're gonna go into some examples around these open tasks. So open tasks, what we do with open tasks is we give teachers opportunities to actually use any curriculum and then start to design tasks that go and hook in students who are in the lower levels and upper levels. And some of the more recent open tasks that we've been exploring with teachers are actually in small schools. So kids in year one and year six in the same classroom on the same task. And when we get that happening, that's when teachers get really excited, which is great to see. There's a lot of semantics around the country, around the world, actually, for open tasks. As we know, it's quite lucrative to keep renaming things. So the idea is we're just going to take the idea around open, we're going to look at them in the beginning sense. And these, there's no set problem to solve, but they're wonderful tasks to initiate curiosity, exploration, and guided discovery. And there's also open-ended, which tend to be set problems with multiple solutions. There's also open middle as well, which more we call open beginning, where you know it might have one answer, but there's multiple pathways to get there. And I'm sure in a couple of years, there'll be more um, open type task being developed. So the first one, these again are written by teachers for teachers because you want teachers to be able to work with like-minded people and share ideas. That's the beauty of what I'm able to bring today. 
And one type of example is where teachers look at a curriculum and they decide, how can we start to link and interrelate concepts of number together? Because in doing so, we don't need to rely on, you know, books all the time. We can actually start to have a think about it. So this one, we're going to be looking at one that we've taken around a number of schools around Aotearoa and Aust Australia around coins. We use coins because all schools have them and they're still a useful representational model for number. So students were asked to create and describe their own pattern. And we give them, like anything, an explicit teaching example. They have to represent it. We often bring in number lines because number lines are one of those amazing, important things. And we found in Australia, with doing a lot of work with the year nine, 10 numeracy over four years, this was actually improving high school's capacity to actually get ready for the numeracy area and also year 12, 13. So number lines um, are a really powerful thing to start get kids used to all the time. We also then get them to pose their own question. And usually by the question, depending on the year level, we obviously look at the integrity of the curriculum for that appropriate year level. And then we adjust it you know, in order to see some students are just looking at skip counting patterns. Older kids are looking at you know, types of equations and predicting those. And of course, getting kids to solve it. So what does this look like in a classroom? That's what teachers really want to know. So what happens with these sorts of things? When we go around the country, we actually sit with teachers and we bring the kids in as part of the learning process. And we sit the kids down, explain quite clearly what these are about. Because I think all students, whether we're their new entrant or year 13, we show them the curriculum. We tell them why they have to learn it and what it means to be able to do that. Then they go off in groups and they start to um, investigate it. In this particular case, because of the high ceiling nature of these, mixed ability classrooms work really well for this because all our tamariki can choose open responses. The high ceiling allows some teachers to witness students going into positive and negative integers and decimals, sometimes quite in a powerful sense, before they'd even explicitly taught it, which shows just because we haven't taught it doesn't mean kids don't know what they're doing already. So they're really good tasks, these. But then we can also go and take it into year three and four. And we show teachers how the same task can be used in year three, four. We then take it down into new entrant and one, the same task in new entrant and one, the same task in year five. So now we've got the task in year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And three weeks ago, I was over in the high schools in Brisbane. Because we want teachers to realize that if we relinquish that deficit model, open tasks when well designed can go across. It doesn't matter where a kid is with a jam test or a gloss test or a stage, that's irrelevant. We want to give all our kids opportunities to access the curriculum and we need to make sure we have tasks that allow them to do that. So when we go into these ways, what we're looking at here is we use the curriculum in its draft form at the moment and hopefully this will stay. The no's and do's are great. And they're really helpful in giving teachers clarity around the sorts of things. And when the pathways come out as well, they're going to be even more, you know, even better. So, you know, these are fantastic teachers. And what we do here, we say to teachers, let's look at this curriculum. Let's look at how we can design an open task by bringing some of these things together. Now, when we're doing this in a more you know, hands-on interface way, we get teachers, and you'll see some examples soon, actually, of brainstorming ideas around getting the curriculum out. How can we manipulate the curriculum to fit this real good task? Because once you've got a good task, you can suck the no's and do's in, you know? And we want teachers to be more fluent with this. There's a time and a place for teaching every single sentence of every single no in a, in a linear way, which is quite common. But we also want to complement that with plenty of opportunities where kids can mix and merge. We know the curriculum is like a spider's web and open tasks allow us to do that. What's great about these is assessment for learning opportunities because we want teachers to be confident enough that confident teachers assess with no test and no interview. And we want to build teachers' capacity to do that because once they can do that, they're going to be more readily open to bringing open tasks and unfamiliar tasks into their daily repertoires. So every 
all Tamil people who get equitable and inclusive opportunities to do these things. So the idea is once a teacher is comfortable that they can assess without a test and without um, an interview as, as well, then these open tasks really start to provide ongoing assessment. That's what we mean by notice, recognise, respond. It's building the capacity to do that. We also know that when we're looking at open tasks, and I've got a few slides on here just to share with you as well, one basic task is created. What we then do, this was before the no's and do's come out, we want to empower our teachers to say, let's look at that task in terms of level one, level two, level three, level four. Because a professional learning that does this, this is what the teachers want and this is what they need to be able to see how we can move around the school. So the idea is to build their capacity. So open tasks then, schools are now building a repository of these in their school drives for 2025. Because 2024 is a year to play. We found that, we learned that from Australia when I was the advisor there around two years about any policy that's being written is only as good as the pedagogical practices of the teachers who deliver it. So we want to make sure that this goes through. Otherwise, no, we'll be doing another refresh in 2030. So the idea is let's get this going. Here's some insights as well that we share because teachers love to see insights and these become worked examples as well. So looking at examples of year one and two here, these are great. So the next few slides, I've just shown you a couple more things that we can go through. Again, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We encourage teachers to use things that are already there. Our Thero is blessed with resources like NZ Maths, which is, no, we know that over 40% of it is comes from outside New Zealand because it's a really powerful resource. And we need to really embrace some of these wonderful resources that we have in front of us. So going to Enrich, for example, from the UK, Cambridge University. So what happens here? We take a question. We look at how it can be scaled up. Then we go into different classrooms. This is it with year ones and twos. Looking at fun. This is it with year threes and fours. This is it with year fives and six sixes. And we start to collate. And I think this is what gives teachers confidence. And if we're going to do open tasks, which is an essential part of any common practice model or any of the top 10 teaching strategies globally, we want to give them success. Make sure the tasks they're using, they can see they can be worked across different year levels, regardless of where the kids are. We're inviting our Tamariki in to have a go, have a play and feel that they can contribute to this as well. So as I said, we've put a couple more little examples in there as slides as reference points just to see. And another little thing of that is giving kids a bit of agency. And I think you'll see soon, we'll talk about a bit of agency, but here's a quick snapshot. Over in Dubai, what we're doing is we're trying to get open class um, in and you'll see later one of the recommendations by Professor Peter Sullivan, who was in, you know, who was um, in charge of the first Australian refresh in 2013. He talks about, you know, giving kids personalization skills so they can take an activity of maths and bring their own culture, their own experiences in. And it's a really powerful way. So this is now a um, routine. And whether they're in new entrant year one or going up into junior high school, it's a routine that kids know so they can focus on the mathematical rigor. And then the teachers are using these open type tasks to actually say to kids, show me from last week, we were doing fractions. Year eight, we were doing some you know, scientific notation with your kids. Can you show me that now in a context of your choice, in a context of sport or shopping? So these are very quick, instant ways there's another thing we found from research over two years with high school and out of field teachers and some primary. They sometimes felt that they needed to have a better intrinsic feel of maths themselves to be able to do these tasks. And when we said, well, one way is just to invite your Tamariki to bring in experiences from their own life. That's a lovely way of giving them a layer of cognition that they can access immediately. Teachers feel compelled. I can do this. So this is a really nice way of doing one of these things. And you'll see it's one of Peter Sullivan's, one of his four ways of opening tasks up. The second insight for Open Beginning builds on the work we've done over the number of years around how we improve children's numeracy capability. 
I'm talking not just numeracy capability in just arithmetic, because that's the wrong interpretation. Numeracy as in the sorts of things year 10 are now having, and over in Australia, year nines have been having for a number of years and around the world. It's looking at maths in context and maths with representations because numeracy tends to assess maths with all the proficiencies and the do's, not just the, you know, the explicit skills. So the idea here is on our web page that some of you are familiar with, we've created these open move and prove tasks that go from new entrant into high school. And what we're doing with these, these can be turned into an open task. And the beauty of this is you don't need to go and buy anything. You know, there's so much money being made. And I think teachers feeling overwhelmed and intimidated. We want to clear a path you can navigate through to say to teachers, use what you've got. Let's start investing the money, not to external resources. Let's start investing it within the school and building teachers capacity within. OK, there's plenty of stuff available now free as well. So the idea here is move and proves that schools are familiar with. You can take one of these. And I've shoved a little picture here of an amazing new entrant teacher in Sacred Heart who uses Move and Proves two or three times a week because it's a really powerful way of a routine. It actually opens up. The kids get a Move and Prove. It creates a initial catalyst for curiosity and doubt. And then the kids go off and explore. I was blown away by going in and visiting her. The confidence she had to show, show me fantastic i said these are all the do's and you've got all the common practice models happening before they're even released i said it's it's incredible and it was just so invigorating to be with this lady who was amazing now a move and prove as we know is run with learners to put teachers to diagnose without a test in five minutes it also promotes the skills around articulation collaboration communication formulate modeling all those skills so a move and prove in, it, in essence is a basic skill like this and what we do with them, teachers turn them into a weekly routine where the students basically open that up and create their own. This is just one example. So the students are asked, you're now going to, for your ongoing task for this week, your open task of the week is to choose your own activity in pairs. That's your context coming in. You can choose your own appropriate unit of time because we want you to feel safe when you first do these. The teacher might decide that group A at the back who might be taking a free ride. No, guys, I want you to do seconds. You're not just going to do hours all the time. The second thing we say is like then choose a different duration. Some students want to happily just do one and two, one hour or two hour. Some might do units of time like 10, 20, 30. Some might do improper fractions. So, again, you're getting quite a range of ability here just by tweaking the numbers. You've got to create one correct start and finish time. And then you've also got to create three wrong. And please make sure you check with each other, because, again, you've got to reason that your answers are reasonable. So, again, we're opening up kids to be to actually value, first of all, what the do's are before we start teaching them and then swap them with another classmate. And what we found over here, these are just, just some ones that we got from a year four class. The teacher was using technology in a brilliant way. It made me resonate to one of Marilyn Goose's articles from years ago about some teachers who are a slave to technology and some teachers who can master technology. This teacher was certainly mastering the technology here. And it was amazing to see the kids interaction. So they went off. And the teacher said, Rob, I give them like 10 minutes initially to get going, and then it becomes my ongoing task. So when kids finish early, I've banned the word do, I've banned the word done, and I've banned the word kids coming in, holding me. What are we doing now? We have these as a process, and it's like fantastic. That's what we want to do. But the kids initially aren't very good at writing the wrong answers, um, and that's part of this whole process because the wrong answers – are usually obviously wrong. But as they get better, we know from explicit instruction, which actually cements the core skills. As kids get better at using examples and non-examples, it shows they have a conceptual understanding of these procedures, facts, or processes. So this is a really powerful way. And it also, you can see from here, it also helps teachers understand what conceptual understanding is. It's great that in the do's we say conceptual understanding in most countries is representations and connections. So in Artero, it's wonderful to see we've got represent and connect separate. I think you know, in a sad way that excites me a bit because it's really powerful for teachers to see those two things are critical. So the do's are fantastic. 
even for explicit teaching and back to basics, if there's somehow a push to go back to that, you still need to do the do. So the do's hopefully, you know, will stay. It'll certainly put the you know, put all our um, tamarikina artaroa a step in the right direction. So hopefully that there'll be no interference with that. So connections and representations are brilliant because the same move and proof with visual representation, you can imagine the kids are like, oh, no, that's easier. I said, no, it's not easier. That's the same question with conception understanding. Can you see the difference? And the kids are like, oh, okay, we want you to do that then. Oh, okay then. Because suddenly if you're good at drawing and sketching, welcome back to maths, you know? I do that when I'm with year 12s and 13s. So many kids can actually draw and use things. So it excites the kids again. It's wonderful to see. So what we've done with teachers is all the move and proofs are starting to be turned into little open tasks. And I will resonate again with this with teachers. These are really powerful because you don't need to go off and buy anything. When Australia brought out the national curriculum, as you can imagine, we were inundated with all these new books with all the right words and all the right names being used. So I know, buy me, buy me, buy me. But rather than buy fish, let's teach our teachers to fish. Once you get people and there's plenty of mass, wonderful mass people around this country in Aotearoa. Once we get those you know, experts out there into schools actually doing subject specific pedagogy, we can build teachers capacity to write some of these and get those kids back again. So it's really exciting opportunities here. So we've got this one. We've got the move and proves coming in here. Again, teachers are having a play. And these are just some examples to share with you. But it's a nice little process. And all the time we're talking about explicit teaching. Because even though a lot of people think it's being done, it's not being done that well because it needs a lot of visual sides as well. So the last thing, the last area of open is open-ended. Now, open-ended is slightly different. These time, these are questions or a problem and they have multiple answers. So once again, initially, some kids we find, whether they're young or even in high school, a little bit reluctant about these because for them, their thought process is how can I be right? And that answer over there is wrong to my knowledge. And it's right as well. And it's well, actually, sometimes in life, there's more than one answer and we need to give build your resilience up for that as well. So the idea here is what you can do to make them is you just identify a maths topic. So, for example, let's just take area, a nice change to number. And with that, you just take a closed question. So we encourage teachers, go online, go into a book because there's some great basic stuff in there that is essential and we need to make sure we use those. So take one there and it might be something like this. You know, what's the area of this shape? So basically, you know, as one teacher said, Rob, that's just a times table fact with a rectangle in it. And it's like, well, actually it is. It's not really much. You don't need to know much about area to solve something like this. But... The idea is then you take that 30 and then you tweak the question. The area of a rectangle is 30 meters squared. What might the width and the length measure? So suddenly you've turned that task up onto its head. And then as a teacher, think, oh, OK, I could go and use one question from a book because these days textbooks things have got some wonderful things in it. You know, you go through them. There's all the conception of standing ideas in there. Teacher workbooks have all these in there. So, you know, we need just to utilize all these things. And Peter's latest article, or one from a couple of years ago that, you know, we've got permission to use here. He talks about four strategies for creating open ended tasks. And I would really um, send out there to the sector, all those who watch this, to principals as well. Give teachers 20 minutes in a staff meeting to read this article and start writing some with the draft curriculum so they can start to navigate around it. We want to give teachers opportunities to actually be familiar, to have a deeper, de deeper dive into the curriculum documents and to actually see how useful they are to make their own resources. So strategy one, is making tasks open by working from the answer. And that was what I just did with the area. Number two is making tasks open by creating blanks. Okay, I'll just show you one of these actually. So this is, here's one. So a basic one can be found from a book. 25 plus 35 equals 60. So what we did is we flipped on its head. What two numbers added? 
Now, there's a caveat here as teachers, and sometimes this looks good, but you can imagine some kids just sit on a desk and start writing 59 and 1, 58 and 2, 57 and 3, and it could, they could be out there for 45 minutes, but they're not actually learned anything, you know. So we need to make sure we're careful that we don't want tasks to be too open. Introduce a restriction. We encourage teachers to say, when you look at this, you need to have up your sleeve like a magician, a bit of a restriction. Now, these restrictions are really powerful. This enables teachers to differentiate in the moment, to notice and respond in the moment. So that's why we say to teachers, start practicing these now because you will feel so much more confident to teach the intent of any curriculum around the world with all the do's and no's if you can start to get into the habit of doing this. Now, you can see from here, what we gave teachers just in five minutes, we said, how would you, relevant to the year levels or the tamariki you teach, what sort of ideas with properties of number could you just instantly, as creative professionals yourselves, what can you come up with to have a go at these sorts of things? So what you can see on here, you know, the numbers both must be multiples of five. The numbers, both numbers must be more than $10. We've contextualized it now with money. Um, the dollars and cents, even numbers, it has a sale price. One is 50% less than the other one. We had some teachers, because we have high school teachers coming, they spoke about um, one wanted to make it into an equation. We're doing ratios. The first item is in the ratio of three to one to the second item. Negative integers came into it. The idea is teachers realize themselves, wow, I can think about all the number properties and actually make this low floor height ceiling, but the concept's the same, so we can still talk about it. Now, in the chat room, just out of interest, can you as teachers think of any more restrictions you could add onto this? So imagine you've got a room of, say, 30 kids all at different levels doing this. Table A, you can't use any multiples of five. And, you know, you can't have them both being even. So that adds another layer of cognition. Table B, sorry, guys, but you need to use dollars and cents today. It's like, oh, do we have? Yes, you have to. OK, over here, the first amount has to be less than a quarter of the total amount. Whereas in year one and new entrant, we've seen teachers change the number just to ten dollars. And each coin, they've got some coins or some blocks, some 10 frames where this is worth one, this is worth two. And the kids have been investigating that as well. So the idea is taking something as simple as this question and then giving teachers five or 10 minutes in groups with the no's and do's in their draft form so they can interact with it and then take them through it. Brilliant, you know, because teachers realize, oh, actually, I didn't know that was in the curriculum there. When it's the same thing here. So the idea is to get teachers having to think about this, using odd and even, using whole, using fractions, using ratios, using properties of number. It's a great way to do it. I've just stuck in as well a couple of this. We got them into, no, this is when I do like to use butcher paper and pens and things, you know, it's useful for this. So, you know, teachers then two or three minutes brainstorm. And then we got them all to share. And within about 15 minutes, we had about 35 different open tasks, all from the same stimulus. And it's proof. Give te teacher plus time plus trust equals fantastic resources. That's what teachers want, a bit more time to get together in a collective way and just design. It's a great way to interact with the curriculum. The second part of Peter's work says openness to personalising and forcing connections. When he says forcing connections, there's no physical element to that. It's more a case of, you know, getting kids to think because we want them to reason and generalize eventually. And this is a nice way of starting that process. You can't have a conversation or discourse if there's any, every kid's doing the same strategy, you know? You've got to have a bit of difference here. In fact, an article I read recently around critical thinking, critical thinking in humans, is only activated if there's curiosity or doubt. 
So if it's everything is fixed all the time, there's no critical thinking, despite the critical thinking being on a nice laminated poster at the back of the classroom. We need to make sure the questions trigger doubt or curiosity and open are brilliant for that. And forcing connections is really good. So personalising, I'll just take your memory back to that article, that slide I showed you from Dubai, where the kids are regularly encouraged to bring that into the different questions. And also a little journey over to new entering class. OK, this is one over on um, Sunshine Coast, actually. And what the teacher was doing here, you could tell the kids are well behaved because it looks like they've got you no know, rulers at their backs or someone sprayed them with starch. Up they go. And what they've got here, all the beads, but the teachers give them a dice to roll. Just a dice opens up that personalization because those teachers who teach new entrant and one, they, they get very excited about this. And they think pair share a way to represent it. And then you can see the teacher here drew some of the representations on. But the focus is not on calculate. The focus is on operate, which is really powerful. And that will, um, Conrad Wolfram from that TED talk years ago spoke, speaks about 90% of maths in the world is not calculate, but still in high schools and books and things, it's all calculate, calculate. So we want to make sure we transition from, from that. But things are getting much better these days. And what the teacher does for this open task, the kids can choose. And then the kids then um, come up with some stories or the teacher comes up with some stories. So here, with the board she says on monday i had two pokemon cards because the kids chose the context this was a couple of years ago actually pokemon cards i got two more on tuesday and three more on wednesday but the answer is not a number because it's a that's a really refreshing thing the answer so she said number answers are banned so the answer is a name so the kids then have to match the story visualize it turn and talk picture it but there's no rushing for the kid who's memorized number facts by heart before we start school and the parents think they're Einstein. What's happening here is the kids are just having a play, but they're focusing on the openness of it. And it's brilliant because this is a way of opening up by personalizing. So Peter's obviously Sullivan done a lot of research in this area. And when he came up to work with us on the Sunshine Coast over a few years, he said to, he came to all the schools as well and said, look, teachers, have a go with this because this will liberate some of your kids. It will really and have the confidence to still cover the maths and the do's, which in Australia are called the proficiencies. And it's a great way to get them talking, discourse, formulating, modelling even. All those skills start in those new entrant year one areas. That's that slide again from Dubai. So finally, how are teachers using open tasks? Well, we looked at some schools who've been doing these for four or five years. And this is where it's nice to go back to these teachers and say, look, four or five years later, um, obviously, sometimes the ball is dropped because management change and the two years of maths, they flip back to English again. It seems to suck the thing back. But we want them to you know, enhance and sustain good teaching maths policies. So a lot of schools are still doing it. And we asked them, what are you doing to make open-ended tasks become an integral part of your school's approach to mathematics what are you doing to induct new staff what routines have you got and these were six of the things they came up with some teachers use open tasks as early finishers in other words on the back of the table when the kids start work each week some teachers print out lots of figure it out figure it out is one of the most underutilized resources and the idea that some of those figure out resources out there have been taken and used and sold back. Let's get them for free from NZ Maths. They're brilliant. So the early finishers, three or four open tasks on the back table. And the routine is, kids, you know the rules for open tasks, the pedagogy for that. It's collaborative, it's talking, it's sharing. And you'll be expected to do that independently while I'm with the focus group. So there's that one. The second way some teachers have it is they choose one as a weekly focus and they give the kids five minutes on Wednesday, five minutes on Thursday. Then on Friday, Friday is 20 minutes of mathematical discourse. Let's do a pair and share. Let's get kids moving around the room. Because when we move to five hours of maths a week, it does upset me that even in Australia, after a number of years, they never reach that five. 
So in order to reach that, open task is a lovely way of having a 20, 30 minute lesson where the kids are moving, sharing, looking at each other, the teachers facilitating discussion, articulation, argumentation, getting kids to look at different ways, compare and contrast different strategies, you know, doing all those sorts of skills we need to help with numeracy down the track. The third way, rotations. Some teachers love using rotations. There's nothing wrong with rotations. Having a rotation where the teacher's doing some explicit teaching with one group, there's some independent inquiry over there, and there's kids working on some open tasks, and they rotate. So it's a great way of using it here. Diagnostic, a great way to see. My, Professor Mike Askey used to talk about exploratory inquiry. And the diagnostic way of doing it, this week, kids, we're going to do a thing on time. But before we do time, I'm going to give you five, 10 minutes with an open task just to see what you bring to this mathematics forum. We're all a big maths fano here. So an open task, brilliant way to get to know the kids. They're in a way, it's assessment as learning here. And so the kids are enjoying it, the teacher's walking around, and within 10 minutes, you get to see, oh, right, I'm making note of these four, they know it already. They're going to be bored if I have this at twinkle activity, you know. We want to make sure we've got some other things as well. Number five, exit pass. Great idea. To show me that you've understood clocks this week, here's a quick open task. I've got evidence that you can do your closed procedure stuff, which is useful, but I want you to apply it. As teachers, in the same way we would say, if we're teaching adverbs, we might teach kids some um, closed procedure. Here's a underline the adverbs on Monday, on Tuesday it might be. Here's a paragraph with 10 holes at the bottom of 15 words. Can you choose the adverbs to put in? Nothing wrong with that because we're just getting them um, used to it. Level it up a bit. You might have 10 sentence starters. Can you continue the sentences by putting adverbs in? Now, if a child got all those three worksheets right, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, a teacher wouldn't make a judgment to say they have mastered adverbs they would allow them to have an open or unfamiliar task. Now that in English is like a creative writing or report writing. And that is how we assess. So in mathematics, the equivalent is really having open tasks. So it's great that they've got their worksheets right and know that the closed procedure filling in you no know, copy and complete exercises and books and things or online, but they also need to open that task up because that will safeguard conception understanding and probably, more likely, allow next year's teacher to reteach less. And I think we owe it to next year's teacher and the Tamariki to remember the concepts more than short term on a closed procedure and open up the task, which is more fun for them. So you've got all these ideas. And what's great to see, some schools are using them in newsletters. Hi, everybody. How far now? In term one, this term, we are doing a couple of open tasks. The one in the newsletter has been shown to kids in years one to year eight. As a parent or whānau or grandparent, please could you just play this game with your kids or this open task because this is your homework of the term. So again, we're looking at those sorts of strategies. Uh, those sorts of strategies. So wrapping up, the key to future proofing any math school approach, as we know for open especially, is developing the knowledge for teaching maths. Without this, we'll have a perpetual cycle of refreshes all the time. But if we can enhance this, because you know, we know from the practices, the programs, the formative assessment, all those, we want to build this. And open tasks, believe it or not, are one of the real, are the process of designing them are a really powerful way of building the capacity that Marilyn Goose talks about, the knowledge for teaching maths. So not only are you giving kids tasks that they can access and enjoy and engage with, maintaining the mathematical rigor? You're also building up teachers' capacity to navigate through the curriculum in their head, which is required for formative assessment. So you've got these wonderful things. Kill two birds with one stone. And we know again, Anthony Walshaw, teacher knowledge is fundamental. And any policy and any program needs this knowledge that Marilyn talks about in that wealth of evidence. So last thing, providence and consistency across the whole school, open is one such task. And I've just summarized here some of the things I've said, you know, because as teachers, we owe it to our Tamariki and the teacher who comes before us and after us, that we also, for mathematics, teach the words I put there. Because we've also found 
that sometimes teachers have a go, but you see open actually requires more than just maths. It requires collaboration, articulation, argumentation, and generalization. And if those haven't been taught, sadly, it might be, oh, no, I can't do those. It's too hard, too noisy. The kids are off time. We need to embrace a whole school approach that if open tasks are going to be done authentically and as intended as the intent, enacted as the intent, we need to make sure the whole school says this is part of mathematics. And it's definitely part of numeracy. Ensure every Tamariki get these. I don't care if they're year four and they're stage one, they can do open tasks. No, that's a deficit thinking model. We need to make sure that the notice recognised respond element are assessment for learning opportunities. And we also want to make sure that when we're doing this open task, again, I refer to Peter Lillijar's recent book. He, he hits this really well. He wants to see kids are moving, standing, not just sitting at desks and writing on paper, vertical boards on the table, moving that around. That should be part of a balanced diet as well. So a reminder, we're now getting schools on our site from Australia and New Zealand to share best practice around how they're planning and future proofing their school because we want to make sure good mass is good mass we know the political pendulum will always swing from side to side but good mass let's get our teachers and our principals having a way to enhance maths with open-ended tasks is one such thing and it's great and encouraging to see schools starting to share ideas now around open tasks which is fantastic to see and yeah i mean what we're doing We've got lots of schools around the country now for 2024. So Marie Hurst, myself and Joe, we're just going around. And we invite schools in as well. Now, if you want to come and see some of the activities in action, come and see. If you want to go onto the Facebook site, you know, it's teachers for teachers. There's no pay. It's just hop on and we're encouraging teachers to share. There's going to be a focus now on the open types of tasks, what pedagogies are needed for this, because... I think if you as busy teachers, this is a hard job, this, you're constantly on the go all the time. And if we can give you some opportunities to try out some open tasks in 2024, we want to give you some resources and ideas that you can take that have been used by other teachers, other like-minded teachers trying things out. Because I feel that for 2024, if we want to build a consistent and aligned approach to teaching and delivering a, a curriculum, we want to give teachers time in that space. So I would heartily recommend the Peter Sullivan book is a really powerful resource to get some open task into your kit straight away to get your other teachers onto the walker, onto that you no know, canoe as we travel through. Show a few of the things from the Move and Prove and the ideas I've shown you today, because these have been tried and tested for two, four, six years by primary and high school teachers and we get them to post them up once they've been, you know, they feel they can be replicated. So I just want you to enjoy the open tasks. I've given you some ideas there. You know, feel free to get in touch because we've got plenty of little ideas around. But what's beautiful about this is it's just these ideas are coming from teachers from across the sector because teachers choose this career to be autonomous and flexible. They want some guidance from a policy, but the idea is open tasks really invigorate teachers' creativity. So the idea is let's get working together as a bit of a collective here. We've got some wonderful teachers all over the country and PD providers as well. So if we can enhance this open approach, I think this is a really good way to get teachers at Tamariki you know, contributing to math together. So thank you for your time today, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass back to the AMA. Kia ora, Rob. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and your experience. That's today. okay. So much to pick up um, in such a short time. Uh, thank you for reminding us that at the end of the day, that it's not the books or anything like that, but it's our teachers that are the ultimate resource. And Absolutely. On that note, on that note, let me just say to everyone here that it's a sunny morning in Auckland and you've chosen to be here. So you are all priceless and your schools are blessed to have you. That concludes our session. And so have an excellent day, everyone.